chapter 27 in the garden. In each century since the beginning of the world, wonderful things have been discovered. In the last century, more amazing things were found out than in any century before. In this new century, hundreds of things still more astonishing will be brought to light. At first, people refuse to believe that a strange new thing can be done. Then they begin to hope that it can be done. And then they see that it can be done. Then it is done. And all the world wonders why it was not done centuries ago. One of the new things people began to find out in the last century was that thoughts, just mere thoughts, are as powerful as electric batteries as good for one as sunlight is, or as bad for one as poison. To let a sad thought or a bad one get into your mind is as dangerous as letting a scarlet fever germ into your body. If you let it stay there after it has got in you, you may never get over it as long as you live. So as long as Mistress Mary's mind was full of disagreeable thoughts about her dislikes and sour opinions of people and her determination not to be pleased by or interested in anything. She was a yellow-faced, sickly, bored, and wretched child. Circumstances, however, were very kind to her. Though she was not at all aware of it, they began to push her about for her own good. When her mind gradually filled itself with robins and moorland cottages crowded with children and strange crabbed old gardeners and common little Yorkshire housemaids with springtime and with secret gardens coming alive day by day and also with a moor boy and his creatures. There was no room left for the disagreeable thoughts which affected her liver and her digestion and made her yellow and tired. So long as Colin shut himself up in his room and thought only of his fears and weakness and his detestation of people who looked at him and reflected hourly on humps and early death, he was a hysterical, half-crazy little hypochondriac who knew nothing of the sunshine and the spring and also did not know that he could get well and could stand upon his feet if he tried to do it. When new, beautiful thoughts began to push out the old, hideous ones, life began to come back to him. His blood ran healthily through his veins, and strength poured into him like a flood. His scientific experiment was quite practical and simple, and there was nothing weird about it at all. Much more surprising things can happen to anyone who, when a disagreeable or discouraged thought comes into his mind, just has the sense to remember in time and to push it out by pushing in an agreeable, determinedly courageous one. Two things cannot be in one place. Where you tend a rose, my lad, a thistle cannot grow. While the secret garden was coming alive and two children were coming alive with it, there was a man wandering about certain faraway beautiful places in the Norwegian fjords and the valleys and mountains of Switzerland. And he was a man who for 10 years had kept his mind filled with dark and heartbroken thinking. He had not been courageous. He had never tried to put any other thoughts in the place of the dark ones. He had wandered by blue lakes and thought, <clears throat> and thought them, he had laid on mountainsides with sheets of deep blue genitins blooming all around him and flower breaths filled all the air, and he had thought them. A terrible sorrow had fallen upon him and he had been a <clears throat> when he had been happy and he had let his soul fill itself with blackness and had refused obstinately to allow any rift of light to pierce through. He had forgotten and deserted his home and his duties. When he traveled about 
darkness so brooded over him that the sight of him was a wrong done to other people because it was as if he poisoned the air about him with gloom. Most strangers thought he must be either half mad or a man with some hidden crime on his soul. He was a tall man with a drawn face and crooked shoulders and his name that he always entered on the hotel registers was Archibald Craven, Misselthwaite Manor, Yorkshire, England. He had traveled far and wide since the day he saw Mistress Mary in his study and told her that she might have her bit of earth. And he had been in the most beautiful places in Europe, though he had remained nowhere more than a few days. He had chosen the quietest and remotest spots. He had been on the tops of mountains whose heads were in the clouds and had looked down on other mountains when the sun rose and touched them with such light as it made it seem as if the world were just being born. But the light had never seemed to touch himself until one day when he realized that for the first time in 10 years, a strange thing had happened. He was in a wonderful valley in the Austrian Tyrol and he had been walking alone through such beauty as might have lifted any man's soul out of shadow. He had walked a long way and it had not lifted his. But at last he had felt tired and he had thrown himself down to rest on a carpet of moss by a stream. It was a clear little stream which ran quite merrily along its narrow way through the luscious, damp greenness. Sometimes it made a sound rather like very low laughter as it bubbled over and around the stones. He saw birds come and dip their beaks in and drink it and then flick their wings and fly away. It seemed like a thing alive and yet its tiny voice made the stillness seem deeper the valley was very, very still. As he sat gazing into the clear running of the water, Archibald Craven gradually felt his mind and body both grow quiet, as quiet as the valley itself. He wondered if he were going to sleep, but he was not. He sat and he gazed at the sunlit water and his eyes began to see things growing at its edge. There was one lovely mass of blue forget-me-nots growing so close to the stream that its leaves were wet, and at these he found himself looking as he remembered he had looked at such things years ago. He was actually thinking tenderly how lovely it was, and what wonders of blue its hundreds of little blossoms held. He did not know that just the simple thought was slowly filling his mind, filling and filling it until other things were softly pushed aside. It was as if a sweet, clear spring had begun to rise in a stagnant pool and had risen and risen until at last it swept the dark water away. But of course, he did not think of this himself. He only knew that the valley seemed to grow quieter and quieter as he sat and stared at the bright, delicate blossoms. He did not know how long he sat there or what was happening to him, but at last he moved as if he were awakening, and he got up slowly and he stood on the moss carpet, drawing a long, deep, soft breath and wondering at himself. Something seemed to have been unbound and released in him very quietly. What is it, he said, almost in a whisper, and he passed his hand over his forehead. I almost feel as if I were alive. I do not know enough about the wonderfulness of undiscovered things to be able to explain how this happened to him. Neither does anyone else yet. He did not understand it at all himself, but he remembered this strange hour months afterwards when he was at Misselthwaite again, and he found out quite by accident that on this very day, Colin had cried out as he went into the secret garden, 
I am going to live forever and ever and ever. The singular calmness remained with him the rest of the evening, and he slept a new reposeful sleep. But it was not with him very long. He did not know that it could be kept. By the next night, he had opened the doors wide to his dark thoughts, and they had come trooping and rushing back. He left the valley, and he went on his wandering way again, but strange as it seemed to him, there were minutes, sometimes half hours, when, without his knowing why, the black burden seemed to lift itself again, and he knew that he was a living man and not a dead one. Slowly, so slowly, for no reason that he knew of, he was coming alive with the garden.